We're going to get to all of that in just a few minutes. We do begin today, though, with a halftime special event. Jamie Dimon with us exclusively today from the J.P. Morgan Global High Yield and Leverage Finance Conference in Miami Beach. Our Leslie Picker is there with him. Les, take it away. Hey, Scott, thank you. And thank you so much to Jamie for being here. So we are at your high yield and leveraged finance conference in Miami. You've got executives, deal makers, investors all kind of coming together to talk about the financing environment. How would you characterize C-suite confidence levels now? First of all, thrilled to be here. Thank you for doing this. This is our 29th conference. I've probably been to 20 of them since I became CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. You know, look, you, gotta, you, look at, you always got to look at markets that they change their mind pretty quickly. But right now, confidence is up. There's more M&A chatter. EC, you know, equity markets open a little bit. Spreads are getting close to historical lows, which is means you know there's a lot of money chasing uh, a high yield deals. So things are kind of open. Markets are high. People feel it. So, so far, so good. That sounds to run somewhat counter to your more bearish views. I know you said um, in fourth quarter earnings that uh, last month that inflation may be stickier, rates may be higher than the markets expect. Is that still your base case? And what's kind of fueling I, that more cautious tone right now? Yeah, so the way I look, you know, remember in 1972, you felt great too. And before any crash, you felt great. And then so things changed. So you have you got to look ahead. And I do think there are things out there which are kind of concerning we've got an eye on. And so, and why are we doing so well? A lot of it's fiscal spending. And fiscal spending has a multiplier too. So I just think it may not come down that quick and people may be surprised. So when people talk about, you know, the market is kind of pricing a soft landing, that may very well happen. But, you know, the odds at 7 or 80%, I would give them half of that. That's all. 7 or 8 rate cuts? No, no 7, 7, 7 or 80% chance we'll have a soft landing. I give it half that. We may very well have one, but I think there's there was also a higher chance in the market things of rates being a little bit higher. The other thing I think it's always a mistake to do is look at just the year. All these factors we talk about, QT, fiscal spending, deficits, the geopolitics, those things may play out over multiple years. But they will play out and they will have an effect. And we just don't know what they are. So I'm just, you know, in my mind, I'm kind of kind of cautious about everything. You're hedging. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about commercial real estate. We've yeah. got nearly a trillion dollars of commercial multifamily real estate debt that will mature this year. About how half much, of that, about a trillion, $929 billion worth. Yeah. Um, half of that is owned by banks, mostly regional banks there. The rest is either securitized or due to non-bank lenders. Um, we've seen higher levels of defaults in certain pockets of uh, the market and a slump in property prices recently. Do you think that stress in commercial real estate will ultimately be the source of the next credit event? You know, first of all, put commercial in perspective with consumer. The consumer markets are far bigger. So it happened in 07 or 08. This isn't that kind of thing. And a lot of these owners of this can handle what you call stress. So in the banking system, I'm just going to focus this on office for a second because there's warehouse, there's data centers, there's hospitals, there's, uh, and some of that stuff is actually well done. Uh, but if you take just offices, first of all, they're worth less because of interest rates. When interest rates go up 300 basis points, whatever you own with their cash flow is worth 30% less. And so people, that's not a crisis. That's kind of a known thing. And then there's the, you know, if you have a recession, yes, it'll get worse. If we don't have a recession, I think most people will be able to muddle through this, you know, refinance, put more equity in. And of course, when you talk about defaults being higher, part of that's just a normalization process. They were so low for so long. So in all of credit, you're watching this, things go up, but they're not at a crisis level. They're just kind of going to normal. So yes, if rates go up and we have a recession, there will be real estate problems. And some banks will have a much bigger real estate problem than others. So you think, you know, as you kind of assess the, the landscape and, and regional banks, there'll be more of a, a whack-a-mole than a kind of domino effect? As long as the economy stays like this, there'll be more of a whack-a-mole. No, there should be no domino effect. The problems you've seen were kind of idiosyncratic problems with Silicon Valley, First Republic, uh, New York Community Bank, uh, and a lot of these, you know, it's also it's very local. I mean, you talk about real estate, I think when you say blanketed, if I call it an office and I'm, I have great leases in it, it's fully leased out, 20-year leases, that's completely different than the spec building. So you really got to dig deeper, and, you know, we try to do that when we look at credit about where it is. It'll be pockets. 
Are you concerned at all about just the migration of, of lending taking place in the non-bank financial sector? I mean, we're here at the Global High Yield and Leverage Finance Conference. I know there are a lot of private credit managers here, uh, but that's something that's caught the regulators' attention as well. Well, finally, they can maybe wake them up a little bit. First of all, I don't mind competition. Some of these people who you call private credit are excellent. They know what they're doing. That doesn't mean they all do. And if you, when you look at policy issues about private credit, first of all, we've been doing it a long time. Just keep in mind, like, we make loans, middle market loans. They came through with a bunch of stuff that made it simpler. Unitrons, actually more expensive. Unitrons, different covenants. You know, you could sign it quickly, no pricing. But there are other things, less transparency, less liquidity, no secondary markets, no research. So you got to look at the whole thing, what works and what doesn't work. It will sort through it. We'll be a competitor. I have no problem knowing that we're going to be a competitor. And a lot of smart people out there, you know, they've been on TV saying, you know, they're dan I said they're dancing in the street, but they agree with me this time. They say, absolutely, the bank, you know, banks are being pushed out of a whole bunch of different businesses. And, you know, I always say if that's what the regulators want, then do it. I'm completely fine with it. JP Morgan will do fine, but it should be done with the forethought, not accidentally. Like I said, there are some negatives. So I think if you have a major recession, you'll probably see some issues in private credit. Whether it's systemic or you know, not, I don't really think so, but it might be in ways we don't understand today. Speaking of competition and regulation, last week we saw a major deal with Capital One, uh, and it's deal to acquire Discover, the potential there is to reshape the, the credit card industry. The combination would create the largest card issuer in the U.S., surpassing J.P. Morgan Chase. For, for now. As measure, for now. So if this deal is approved, does it create more competition for you? I, look, I, I think companies should be allowed to do and innovate and grow and merge and try to challenge things. I think that's good. So I think it's a mistake to act like it's bad. It's good for competition. In fact, some of we I think they should allow some of these smaller banks to merge. If that's how they, they think they can best compete with JP Morgan, you should let them. It may not work in every case, but they, you shouldn't predetermine that. You should let the market uh, predetermine that. In this particular thing, there's the credit card business, which is they'll be bigger, more scale. They're very good at it. I mean, I have enormous respect for Richard Fairbanks and Cap One. Uh, and then there's the networks. The, the debit network and the credit network. The debit network, it may have an unfair advantage versus us. Of course, I have a problem with that. You know, like, why should they be allowed to price debit differently than we price debit just because of a law that was passed? I don't know what the plans are, really. You know, I, like I said, I have a lot of, whatever Richard does, I pay a lot of attention to do. Can they actually create another credit uh, card network? I don't know. Um, but, you know, my view is let them compete. Let them try. And if we think it's unfair, we'll, we'll complain about that. But I'm not worried about it, really. Uh, like I, but we do track everything he does. And on that regulatory bucket. I always make a joke with Richard that the reason I have my job is because of him. Because Cap One is the one that kind of dissected the credit card business. Cap One started to beat the hell out of First USA. First USA, which had been bought by Bank One, collapsed. And it, you know, called into credibility of the management, and they hired me. <laughs> so Richard is why I'm here. <laughs> it all goes full circle. Right.